Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to our first ever virtual beer tasting. So today, Marty is going to lead us in a sampling of the three beers he had recommended that everyone go out and purchase uh, in order to sip and sample and kind of explore um, each of these beers, one from Britain, one from Germany, and one from Belgium. And I am just going to turn this over to Marty and have him take it away. He will let you know which beer we are going to be starting on today. All right. All good. All right, well, uh, thank you everyone for tuning in again today. Um, I, I want to start with the word about the beers that I had on the list. I, I want to just let you know that uh, if you weren't able to procure any one of those in particular, the first choice or the second choices, I fully understand. I mean, it's no big deal. Um, I even had a little trouble myself in getting the first choices. So if you had trouble uh, I, I understand, and uh, not a problem at all. Um, a word about the availability of certain beers, uh, especially import beers these days, because the American craft beer industry has been so successful, um, there are so many breweries these days producing so many beers that even the large retail outlets, such as Binnie's, which happens to be where I go to do my shopping because <laughs> they normally have the best selection. Um, I have found in recent years that more and more of the imported products are kind of being forgotten or, you know, being pushed off the shelf. My local uh, Binny store used to have one aisle of British beers, one aisle of German beers, and one aisle of Belgian beers. And today they have not only been, you know, pushed into a single aisle altogether, but they've even given up space to meads. So you can see that obviously there are fewer and fewer products from these countries um, being made available to Americans. The American craft beers are taking up more and more shelf space. That's, that's the nature of the beast. And it's a, it's, it is unfortunate. I mean, I'm, I'm glad, I'm happy for the success of the craft industry, but it's coming at the expense of the imports. So fewer and fewer Americans are being exposed to these original beer styles. Um, with that in mind, I'm, I'm segueing to the next portion, which as Christine mentioned already, uh, if you hadn't noticed that I had beers listed for Britain and for Germany and for Belgium, and of course, those represent the three countries in the world from which the vast majority of beer styles that we recognize today came from. Um, even though here in the United States, we like to think that, hey, we created all these beer styles. It's, it's simply not true. We have copied and emulated beer styles from around the world, specifically from those uh, three countries in particular. Um, the beer styles that I chose, like I said, even if you weren't able to get, let's say, for instance, Bass or Boddington's or Weinstefan or Hoogarden, um, if you at least were able to get something from one of those three countries, you're close enough, I guess. Um, uh, I myself was not able to get the Weinstefan. I, I assumed wrongly that my local store would have it in stock and they didn't, so I had to settle for my second choice of the, the Hacker Shore. So that's the situation we are in right now. Um, but like I said, at least if you were able to get a product from one of those three countries, uh, consider yourself lucky, I guess. <laughs> uh, before we get started, a couple of comments with regards to um, the proper pouring of these beers. First of all, I would like to think that it should go without saying that beer should always be poured out of the can or the bottle in which it was purchased. Uh, those are, you know, unlike, I guess, you know, sodas or whatever, uh, where people typically drink directly out of the can. Um, I very, very strongly recommend that beer always be poured out of the can or bottle. 
And there's two reasons for that. I think I have covered this in the past, but I'll, I'll do the same here today. And that is number one, you are degassing the beer. Now beer of course is carbonated. Some beers highly carbonated. And by pouring the beer out into a glass, you are causing the CO2 to come out of solution. And that way you're not dealing with having to ingest that carbonation where it ends up in your, your digest, <laughs> digestive tract. Um, the other thing is that the CO2 coming out of solution provides aromatics. It allows you to smell more of that beer, okay? You, you, you take in the aromas of the beer. So that part is important too. So when pouring out the beer, granted pouring it into virtually any vessel is a good first step, it's a, it's a start. But some glasses are better than others. And the, the type of glass that I would like to show you in case you haven't seen anything of this sort before, this is somewhat of a tulip glass. Not, not, there, are, there are beers that are more tulip-like than this one, but this is one that I favor because it has all the important aspects of a good tulip glass. One is that it's stemmed and footed. Um, this allows you to handle the glass from the stem and the foot. That way you're not putting greasy fingerprints all over the glass and um, uh, prematurely warming the beer as you hold it. If it's sitting in a pint glass or one of the many other glasses that, that don't have a handle or that are not stemmed and footed, you're holding the glass and causing the beer to warm up. Um, likewise, because this, the, the shape of this glass, it's slightly bulbous down in this region of the glass and it tapers inward and then it tapers back outward. That's, that's where it gets the name tulip. Although, as I said, other glassware is a little bit more exaggerated than this. It's a little bit more rounded at the bottom, a little bit more tapered, a little bit more flared at the bottom. What makes this glass very effective in tasting beer or any beverage for that matter, is that when you're drinking from it, first of all, because of the tapering of the glass, it's causing the aromatics to be concentrated in the neck of the glass coming up towards where you would be drinking from. Um, secondly, any glass that has a, a nice wide diameter at the top is going to allow, as you're drinking the beer, your nose should actually be inside the opening of the glass. That way you're not only tasting the beer, but smelling it at the same time. Very important, taste and smell go hand in hand when it comes to beverages. So that's why a glass of this sort is, is rather important to, to uh, properly evaluating a beer and in, you know simple enjoyment of the beer. You don't have to be evaluating it. So does anybody have any questions up to this point? Uh, Marty, yes, sir. I uh, went online and looked at the, the glasses that um, uh, the various brands, because mm -hmm. I, I was able to get all three of the beers on the top. Nice. And uh, so I went into my glass collection and, you know, tried to match it up. Actually, for the Stella Artois, I have I have a lot of Stella Artois glasses already, so I already have the Hogan glass, but oh. it doesn't have a taper in, di in either. Okay. And, and when I went to Bass, they had sort of a... a a flat, they didn't, it didn't have a stem either. Right. And neither did the, um, what is it? The Weisheit Stefan. Weisheit Stefan? Yeah, uh, right. they had, uh, I I have a, another beer glass, but it's much bigger. That was more like theirs, the, the Czech Slovakia uh, brand. Uh, but right. it it's also doesn't have a base. Right, it, it's actually very untypical or atypical. Um, of a lot of breweries to use uh, stemmed glassware. Um, keep in mind that a lot of the glassware that's produced with logos, branding, um, the, the number one purpose is for branding purposes. It's to help promote the beer. They don't really care about whether somebody <laughs> is, is studiously sipping their beer. That's not the point for them, at least. Um, okay. So, so yeah, branding, uh, branded glassware is is for the most part, not stemmed and footed. Um, you'll find some Belgian brands that are a little bit more meticulous about that. But yeah, the divine stuff on any kind of wheat beer is going to have, that's all what they call a vase or a vase. It's usually a 16 or 17 ounce glass. Um, and many of the other glasses, especially the, the British, they're, they're typical pint glasses. 
or half pint glasses, straight sided or slightly curved, those sorts. But uh, this well, this is well. I might exit for a moment and get stem glassware. Oh, <laughs> at your leisure, certainly. Um, okay. I will. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, the first beer that we're going to taste today is going to be the Bass Ale or anything that you might have from the UK. Uh, so I believe that the, uh, the second choice there was either Boddington or Speckled Hen or something in that, that realm, okay? Was that the one you weren't able to get? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> she oh, wasn't okay. able to get a British one. Um, you know, and that's unfortunate. Of all the beer or of all the countries out there, it seems to be the British beers that have become the most difficult to find. The Germans are still relatively easy. Certain Belgians are still relatively easy, but the, the British are, have been dropping like flies. And yeah, and it's like, even, I mean, Boddington's itself, I mean, they had such a prevalent ad campaign, what, like 15 years ago? I mean, it's, granted, that's a good amount of time, but it's mm -hmm. like, I remember like that, that whole ad campaign comparing it to ice cream and cream and things like that and seeing it <laughs> everywhere. And it's just, uh, it's just crazy that it's not, it's, it's not so available anymore. Yeah. So, I, I mean, is it, is it the same? I'm, is it the same in all the bars too? Everyone's just gone more local, which I mean, it does make sense, yeah. but definitely probably in some of your like bars where you're going to go and watch world cup and stuff, you're going to be able to get more of your imports. Well, presumably. Yes. Um, yeah. But you know, it, I think one of the excuses that I've heard over and over again, at least within the last year, year and a half is, oh, COVID. Um, to what extent that's true, I yeah. don't know. I think it's become a bit of an excuse. Um, but yeah, unfortunately we are seeing these, these wonderful international brands going by the wayside. So we're having to deal with that deficit. Anyway, uh, the first beer we're starting with is Bass. And uh, if you were by chance uh, tuned in when we did the, uh, the session on British beer, I was mentioning that Bass is one of the original uh, British pale ales. And by the way, um, if you can read that right here, the world's first pale ale. Uh, so they do take credit for being the very first pale ale in the world. And by the way, also by the way, this red triangle, I believe I mentioned that that is also the world's first registered trademark. And that dates back to the late 1700s, there, so I'm told. So we're gonna- I don't think my bottle's imported because down uh, right after it says, brewed by William Bass and Company, then it has Merrimack, New Hampshire. Well, that is true. Um, my bottle also says product of the USA. So <laughs> that's another thing we're dealing with. You would think that a product made here in the United States would be more readily available. But uh, one thing about it being brewed in the United States, we're probably getting it much fresher than we would be coming from elsewhere. So anyway, we wanna do a, a good vigorous pour. And by nature of habit, I never pour a full glass at a time. I always pour, especially for evaluation purposes, I'll just pour um, a couple of two, three sips worth. And not only that, but it gives me a whole lot of glass to uh, capture the aromatics in that beer. So you'll see that it's a really nice uh, amber, almost copper. <laughs> Very clear. Yes? He's, uh, he's already like prost. <laughs> <laughs> it would be cheers for this one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I won't pour my next one is like this. Okay. Um, so... What you should be getting in this beer, knowing that it is British, they use British malts, they use British hops, they use British yeasts. Yes, there is such a thing as terroir as far as these ingredients go, even when made in the United States. If they are made with truly authentic British ingredients, they can make a true to form, a true to style beer as it has been made for a couple of hundred years. So what I'm getting in the aromatics, which by the way, you want to register first, even before you look at the beer. The first thing I get is a little bit of a, a 
floral, perfumey kind of note. Um, and I attribute that to the yeast and maybe the malts. Behind that, there's some, some caramel character. The longer this beer sits and the longer it warms up, it's going to bring out more of the, the, uh, um, the, the malt notes. And again, it's, it's kind of a caramel toffee kind of thing going on there. I, I also get the uh, taste of dried fruit and nuts a little bit. It's, it's not at all unusual for there to be some fruitiness in the beer. Uh, most British beers, uh, and ales in general, you're going to get some fruitiness because of the warm fermentations. That's exactly what the, the, the warmth of the fermentation or the, um, the higher temperature of the fermentation is going to bring out that fruitiness in most yeast strains. And uh, British beers are no exception. So this isn't a particularly rich beer. Um, it's, it's not heavy on the palate. It's, I would say it's medium to medium thin. Um, not particularly- I would say heavy. it's even a little bit sweet. Oh, without question. Without question, it's, it's sweet. Even though this yeah. is called a pale ale and, and most people think of pale ales as being bitter um, and by the way, before this was called pale ale, it was referred to as bitters a couple hundred years ago. This beer is not that bitter at all. Uh, the hops really play a secondary role. They're not that obvious in the nose at all or on the palate. Uh, David, I think you're absolutely right that this is a relatively unrestrained sweet beer. Um, almost too much so for people who, who don't care for that sort of thing but it's very easy drinking. It doesn't linger on the palate too long. No bitterness to speak of, at least none more than a good balance for the malt. Um, but overall, a, an enjoyable beer and one that could be easily paired with food as well. So um, if there are no questions, we can- Marty, yeah, I, I do have a question. So when you're tasting beer, cause I know we, we've all been in um, wine tastings with Mary before. And, you know, it's the, the smell and then the taking in of the beverage and then bringing some air into your mouth in order to get some more of those flavors and aromas working and then kind of chewing it, which I know there is a, um, a brewmaster who is famous for his chewing. Um, are those kind of similar tactics that we might want to take when trying beer as well? They, I would say for the most part, yes. Um, definitely you want to spend some time assessing the aromatics, give the uh, beer a little time to breathe, agitate it maybe a little bit. Cause like I said, when it's the CO2 is coming out of solution, the aromatics come with that. Um, so yes, that's aromatics are, are always uh, the first thing you want to assess. Um, when you taste it, we can actually break it down to four taste, mid taste and, and after taste. Um, one thing that wine tasters do, like you just said, is they introduce air across the palate. That's some people refer to that as aspirating. Um, it's really not widely practiced on beer drinkers because, because um, beer is carbonated. You know, some people like to swish a little bit too. Because beer is carbonated, you're bringing out that carbonation inside your mouth, which you're going to end up with a mouthful of foam. So you have to be careful doing that. Likewise with the aspiration, if, you, if you're not experienced with inhaling through your mouth with liquid in there, you can actually cause yourself to, to cough or choke. So that's not one of the things we do. One of the tricks that I use as a professional beer judge is immediately after swallowing the beer, exhale through your nose. Now, this is a way we call it secondary smelling or reverse smelling. You know, normally when you smell, it's, it's inbound, it's, it's through the nose this way. But after you swallow and exhale through your nose, that's, that's smelling it a second time outbound. You can actually do that. Um, it's, it's a very effective way of taking advantage of every sip and swallow. So. Wow, that's interesting. I've never heard of that before. So, cool, thank you. I just tried and it worked. <laughs> I would hope. <laughs> All right. 
So um, one of the things that I'm sure is discussed in the wine tastings is that between tastings, you should always rinse the palate if, if uh, with nothing more than just water, but sometimes with crackers or a um, bread or some kind of neutral starch to help clear the palate. I will also pour a little bit of water in my glass to clean it out. Or you just use a secondary glass if you have that on hand. Um, we are going to transition to, this one is Kew Garden. I know most people are, um, because of their, their uh, American uh, pronunciations, they're gonna call it Ho Garden, but it's actually pronounced Who Garden. Okay. This, this is actually my beer of preference. All right. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, this beer yeah. comes to us from Belgium. Somehow or another. Yeah. Very specifically from the town of Hoo Garden, from whence it gets its name. Uh, this beer style is actually 400 years old. One of the things that sets this beer style apart from most others in the world is the brewer's use of two primary ingredients in addition to the, the regular the malt, the, the hops, the, the yeast, and so forth. Um, they use, for flavoring ingredients, they use coriander and orange peel, both of which give this beer a light, citrusy, refreshing character. So let's go ahead and pour this. And again, go with some agitation, bring out the nice, uh, we call that a bleached head. You see how intensely white it is? Refer to that as being bleached. Um, very heady. We're going to allow this to settle down for a bit. And while we do, go ahead and take in the aromatics. The citric components of this beer are the most obvious. You should be able to tell, uh, smell both the orange peel and the uh, coriander, which is, is lemony, if you're not familiar with that, the character of, of coriander. Um, You'll also notice that this beer is, it's a little bit more pale than the previous beer. It's also not, it's, it's somewhat opaque. It actually is rather difficult to see through. Um, this is more or less a forerunner to today's hazy IPAs. Um, there are a number, there's a handful of beers from around the world. This one specifically, and actually the next one we're gonna have Hefeweizen from Germany. Um, they do not filter these beers very tightly. They actually allow some of the organic particulate matter to make it all the way through into the finished product in the, in the bottle or in the can. And some of that might be yeast, but most of it is actually protein. And that protein comes from the use of unmalted wheat, where most beers, like the Hefeweizen we're about to try, is made with malted wheat. This beer uses unmalted wheat just to give the wheat the wheaty flavor. And from that, they pick up the starch haze that we now see in the beer in our glass. So that's why it appears um, rather whitish in case you didn't make the connection between the beer name and the style. Wit beer, the word wit is Flemish for white. So in other words, they're referring to this as a white beer. And it, it is indeed one of the palest beers in the entire spectrum of beer styles. So um, again, the, the citric character tends to dominate the nose. That's, that's really what this beer is all about. So let's go ahead and taste. Remember to exhale after the swallow. Picking up just a, a nice light fragrant sweetness, more of the citric components come out. I would say the, the coriander might be a little bit more obvious than the orange peel, but nevertheless, it should be there. Um, the wheat character is there. Um, this, is a, this is not a particularly heavy beer. It's, it's intended to be easy drinking. It's, it's really a, a summary kind of beers. It's, uh, I think it's five, 4.9%. So it's actually relatively low to a, compared to a lot of beers in the marketplace today. Um, 
very easy to sip or very easy to quaff, whatever your predilection might be. Um, this is also one of my favorite beers, given the season. I was introduced to this beer in the 1970s, and I've been drinking it ever since because I really like it. <clears throat> I'm glad to hear that. Um, the, the beer style, this one actually almost went, uh, it almost disappeared from, from the, the worldwide brewing industry. Like I said, it, it came to us from Belgium. And even in Who Garden, where it originated, it started dying out. It was in about the 1960s or so, a Belgian gentleman who was a brewer in Who Garden emigrated to the United States, began brewing his beer here. I don't know if anybody has ever heard the name Pierre Celis, C-E-L-I-S, but he opened up a brewery in Texas in the, 20, I'm sorry, the, about 1995-ish. And his Celis brands were available through the, throughout much of the United States at that time. Um, they did very, very well at that time because he was a forerunner in the industry and he was the one he was probably the one and only person responsible for introducing the Whitbeer style to American brewers. Uh, but unfortunately, he sold the rights to his product to the Miller Brewing Company. And Miller did not do a very good job of marketing it. And they ran the, 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 uh, the, um, the brands into the ground. And so it disappeared from the market altogether. But many other craft brewers did pick up on the style. It was extremely popular back in the 1990s and the aughts. Um, not so much today. I mean, it's kind of died out in favor of many other things such as hazy IPAs and, and all the other abominations that have entered the market. But, What's uh, sort of interesting about this one, I can always get it at Whole Foods. Yeah, I mean, you know, knock on wood for all the people like you who are continue to support the style that keeps it in the market for everyone else. Um, let's, let's hope it stays that way for some time to come. Yeah. Um, any other questions or comments on this beer? All right. With that, let's go ahead and transition to our next one, which will be the German Hefeweizen. Like I said, I was unable to get the, uh, the Weinstefan myself, so I will be uh, sipping a Heckershore. I was able to get it. And believe it or not, I got it at Whole Foods. That's always nice to hear. Mm -hmm. This is something that's become more of a thing among German brewers, especially for the American market. Uh, they're putting more and more of their beers into cans. So um, you know, I know that people are very partial to drinking their beer out of bottles, but this is actually a good thing. Uh, cans, if I haven't said it before, I'll say it now, that cans are much more protective of the product itself. So regardless of what beer style it is, the can is protective of it. So I'm, I'm more than happy to see the product in cans coming here to the, the States. Yeah, it's more... Um... It's more responsible to put things in cans too. That as well, yes. There's something to be said for that. Especially if they're being shipped around a lot too. Exactly. Because that extra weight adds up to extra fossil fuels being burned. And that is, and the fact that cans are more easily recycled than well. Yes, true. So what you should see um, is something that looks similar to this in terms of color and head retention. Um, this head, even though you, you see how I pour the beer rather aggressively, but this is pretty typical for a Hefeweizen anyway. Any beer that has a lot of protein in it, like the, the wit beer we just poured, like any kind of Weizen, yeah, there you go, Gemma. Um, any Hefeweizen, any Weizen beer from Germany has a lot of protein. That protein comes from the wheat, and these beers have very high wheat content in them, so therefore you're going to see them pour a large head and sustain it for some time, unlike a lot of American, let's say, you know, the corporate, uh, domestic corporate products where the head collapses within, you know, half a minute. So very pretty in the glass. Uh, for the most part, uh, golden, amber, 
Um, depending on how you pour it, it may, you might be able to see through it somewhat, but because uh, the style is Hefeweizen, um, Hefe actually means yeast. So this beer does contain yeast. And one of the questions that I get a lot about these beers in particular is, um, what should I do if it has yeast? Should I try and leave that in the can or bottle or should I go ahead and, and, and pour it out and drink it? And I say, oh, by all means, drink it because uh, the yeast is actually healthy for you. It's very high in B-complex vitamins. Uh, the B-complex vitamins, unlike many of the other vitamins, which are fat soluble, the B-complex vitamins are water soluble, meaning that when we perspire and urinate, we are actually losing those B-complex vitamins. So by drinking beer that contains beer yeast, we are actually replenishing those vitamins. So it's all in good health. So <laughs> in this case, I will say Prost. Now, one of the things that's very um, <laughs> true to a, a good German Hefeweizen is that you will smell either, I should say, and or banana or clove. Both of those things are very, very common in most German Hefeweizen. Sometimes the banana is more prevalent. Sometimes the clove is more prevalent. Both of those things come directly from the yeast and the warm temperatures that, that which they're fermented. Brewers in Germany are not putting in banana. They are not putting in clove. These are natural byproducts of the yeast and the warm fermentation. So again, banana and or clove are usually prevalent. And what I find in this one, I think it's a little bit more on the side of clove. So the, I think the banana is there in the background note. I'm curious who has, you know what? I, I did say that I had uh, Hockershaw when in fact I have Polana. I kind of, uh, I misspoke on that one. So who has Weinstefan and who has any other brand? This is Weinstoffer. Okay, very good. And I'm I'm I I don't uh, I don't get the cloves as much as I get that banana. Okay, it's okay. very banana. Okay, um, brewers in Germany know that they can manipulate the the activity of the yeast and what they get out of the yeast simply by raising the temperature or lowering the temperature of their fermentation just a couple of degrees up or down. They can actually accentuate the banana or accentuate the uh, the clove. So depending on who the brewer is, they may do exactly that in manipulating their fermentations to the hot, to the warmer side or to the cooler side. So in there's terms a bitterness to the hops on the first sip. Um, it, there's there's a, a bit of a dryness. It's it's not as sweet as the two previous beers. It does have its own sweetness, but this is a more malt based sweetness. It's 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 somewhat rich, but not overwhelming. It's not cloying in any way. Um, the, the sweetness overcomes that bitterness. I mean, I, I get more mm -hmm. sweetness, but when you first take the first sort of swallow, mm -hmm. there's a bitterness to it. Okay. Now, in addition to the, the, the malt flavor, the barley malt flavor, you might, if you're familiar enough with it, you may be able to pick up on the wheat character in the beer also. I haven't yet mentioned that in Germany, by law, in order for a brewer to call their product a Weizen beer, they must, by law, use 51% or more of wheat malt, okay? These beers are not made from 100% wheat malt. That's, that just doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. But by law, they must use 51% or greater wheat malt in addition to the base of barley malt. Um, that's something that most American brewers are unwilling to do or um, they refuse to do because wheat is actually somewhat difficult to work with. It's, it's an unhusked uh, grain kernel. So it can actually gum up the whole system when they're working with it. So brewers have to be careful when they're working with uh, large volumes of uh, 
a wheat malt. And so, you know, give credit to the Germans who are making this beer on a regular basis because um, in order to make these what they are, they must use very high volumes of, of wheat malt. So cheer or post to them. Not a lot of weight to this, but a little bit more so than the previous two beers. Um, this is only for an alcohol content here. Not seeing it readily, but they are typically in the 6% range. It would be unusual for it to be much higher than that. Um, these beers, um, even though you can find them year round, these are really intended to be summer sippers. And by the way, um, these are also attributed more to the state of Bavaria than the rest of Germany. Um, any American visitor or, or any visitor to Germany who is not familiar with the, the beer scene or the in beer industry scene in Germany, you can't just go to any city in Germany and assume that you can get a good Hefeweizen or any kind of Weizen. This is uh, more or less indigenous to Bavaria far more um, available in Bavaria than it is in the rest of Germany. So keep that in mind. This is 5.4. Okay, that's for the alcohol. Very, yeah, very reasonable for the style. And a quick comment about that particular bottle. You, you said it was Wein, Stefan. I don't know if you noticed, but on the bottle, it should say that it was, that brewery was established in, uh, I forget. Premium Bavaricum. Yeah, but it was established in 1040, I believe, the year 1040. It burned down four times and was rebuilt all four times. <laughs> uh, keeping in mind the breweries throughout the centuries were made out of wood, they were very, very susceptible to burning down. That, that was not unusual for that to happen. But this particular brewery being the oldest in the world, it's, it's happened four times. Um, Under the Hefe Weissbier, they say Bavarian style. There you go. <laughs> Bavarian style is really the the. And I think this is also brewed in the United States. If it was, that would catch me off guard. I haven't seen that in the U.S. At least. I think it's uh, being brewed in uh, Minnesota. Hmm. I'm gonna have to look into that. I uh, that's that comes as news to me. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised these days, but I have not heard that. I'll I will look into that. Thank you for sharing. Anyway, does anybody have any questions on uh, the Hefeweizen or any of the three beers we've had today? No. Did you guys enjoy the tasting? I, I've enjoyed the tasting, but now I think I'm going to go and try to get the secondary ones that if we didn't couldn't get the first one <laughs> to try those. Make because sure round I, it all I, I, out. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I wish you luck. But, no, uh, interesting. I like the reverse breathing to to taste it. That's something I'm going to file away now. That uh, that's something I never heard of, and it definitely you do definitely get a different uh, sensation. Glad to hear that. Yep. Very useful. Is there a particular name to the glass you've been drinking from? Um, or is that just something well, you? I, I refer to it. I refer to it as a pseudo tulip. It's it's not as shapely as a tulip. It's not as, um, you know, this this taper in here is not as drastic as most tulip glasses, but this is my preferred style of glass. On occasion, I will use a true tulip glass, but yeah, that's okay. that's basically what it's referred to. You'll find many different styles of it out there. I find that that's the, the most effective in, in beer evaluation. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I hope everyone well enjoyed their beers and have made the choice of which one you're going to drink next and continue with. So uh, we uh, will have tomorrow um, Wine Wednesday, and it will be part one of Wines of Italy, as we are doing a deep dive in uh, Wines of Italy. And we will be following up with part two the next Wednesday. 
But if you guys have any questions or any requests or suggestions for any upcoming talks, I am always all ears or at least an open inbox all the time. So feel, feel free to send me any requests at taste at nl.edu and we will see you tomorrow. All okay. right. Thank you, everyone. Can you stay on for a moment with me? Absolutely.